All right, everybody, we're back with another spe special, monthly special uh, guest, uh, David Durham. A lot of you know him, you see him on LinkedIn, uh, SaaS Thrive Podcast, selling from SMB to Enterprise. He's the host of that podcast. He's also an enterprise account executive at Labelbox. Um, David's actually going to talk about a subject that I've not really covered on the podcast. Maybe you've seen me talk about it from time to time on LinkedIn or Twitter, whatever it is, or my newsletter, but imposter syndrome. I think a lot of folks that are and I know this for a fact because personally, someone has reached out to me in my community and said, hey, how do I get over the, 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 the problem of lack of confidence? I was an SDR. I was dying to become an AE for so long. I became an AE, but now I just don't, you know, like I feel like I have this like crazy imposter syndrome and it's affecting my, my, just like my confidence, my mental health and all this stuff. And so I was like, crap, like there needs to be some information on like something like tactical. Um, and it's sort of difficult because imposter syndrome is not like, how do you get over an objection? It's, it's not that it's something way more sort of intrinsic. So Dave, I'm going to put, uh, 20 minutes on the clock as we speak, you have the floor, take us through, give some folks here that are, that potentially are dealing with imposter syndrome, which I know they are, yeah. um, how to get over it and what you've done. Yeah. So I think backstory would help actually. Let's do it more. Um, super excited to be on the show, by the way. Like uh, this topic is so, so dear to my heart. So for a little bit of context, you know, I've been in the SaaS tech, you know, sales space for about four years now. And prior to doing that, I was in the real estate industry for a couple of years. So mind you, you know, imposter syndrome can stem from a couple of things. And I think mostly it stems from one, an experience. Mm -hmm. And two, it could be age. And I see both of that happening a lot. And especially in the industry and, and frankly, massively in my life, right? When I was a, a real estate agent, I was 19 years old getting into the business. So you can imagine I'm walking into a real estate office and this is in the greater Sacramento area, very competitive, right? Even four years, ago, it's very competitive space. And when you're going to a listing presentation to close someone to list with you, to give the responsibility to you to sell their house for the most amount of money possible. And you're competing with folks that have been in the business for 10, 20, 30, 40, literally plus years. It's quite difficult. And I remember being in the office, folks literally looking at me like, man, <laughs> I, I, I don't understand, right? They're not trying to be mean, but they're like, I don't understand how someone's going to trust you to sell their house. Like who in the right mind would do that? Like I'm thinking mm -hmm. to myself, like, would I even trust myself? You know, like if I was in their position, would I trust somebody like myself? Like, I don't know. And so the imposter syndrome, like, do I belong here? You know what I mean? Like, can I really do this? Hit home so, so hard. And what I want to talk about today, there are five things. There are five tips that everyone listening can absolutely walk away with. And some I'm definitely going to go more in depth than others. Some are pretty straightforward. Some we're going to unpack a little bit. And I'm going to tie back to that story, right? Because even when I had success, so let me now fast forward. You know, my first year, I closed over 5 million in volume as an agent. Now, this is not San Francisco. This is not LA. I didn't get lucky and have one listing that got me paid out in, in volume, right? My average deal of a house was like 317,000 or something like that. So it was like 17 units. It's like back to back, you know what I mean? Success. Yep. And it wasn't in anybody in my network. I was, I'm a, I was a kid, right? Like who in the hell in my life is buying or selling a house? Nobody. So I fought through it and I had success. How old were you of like when you were doing this? 19. Okay. So I was, I was 19 years old. And then when I got into the tech industry, same exact situation, folks at the company, right? They gave me a shot. I came in. Um, and at what they, age you know, did you come into tech? 21. I guess two years later. Okay. Yep. Two years later. So, so for context, you know, after the real estate, I actually, I did well, I tried building a coaching business, wrote a book. I used that to, to build a coaching business. And then from there transitioned from coaching back into like a full-time sales role and then got into tech. And people told me the same thing in tech, dude, good luck. Now you're selling to C-suite executives. Like, I just want you to know, I'm not saying I don't believe in you. I want you to say, get ready to have a really hard time, right? Because people are going to get up on a call. Who is telling you this VPs or people that like colleagues, like SDRs and AEs? Less than leadership, but um, not SDRs and AEs, I guess, kind of somewhere in the middle. Okay. It's a very early stage company. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, screw it. Yeah, kind of. I mean, imagine other AEs, people that are industry peers telling you this. Okay. And, and you were coming in as an SDR or an AE? Um, just initially uh, as an SDR, but this okay. is this happened. I pretty much was an AE, very close to, to getting okay. started. Um, but it, it happened as both like SDR slash AE. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, 
And so for a little bit of context, right, they're, they're telling me the same things I used to hear. And at that point, I just kind of laughed it off, but it didn't change the fact that it's frustrating as hell, right? When that happens. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, that's a little bit of context. Fast forward, right? Did really well four years there. Now I'm working at Label Box, a new company as an enterprise rep. And what I'm going to talk about today is literally what I still use every single day. So let's get started with the first one. And that's called being weaponized. And I learned this from one of my mentors, who's a, a millionaire real estate investor, different industry, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Same you know, technique tip is going to apply. So think about the time that you felt just in complete beast mode, right? It's like, it's that feeling you had, there was just so much momentum that literally anything thrown your way, you, you can knock it over. You could overcome the obstacle. It wouldn't hold you back. Yep. And so you want to just think back to a time when you were in that position, when you felt that way, whether if it was at work, whether at home, whatever. And then ask yourself some of these questions. What was, you know, what was going on in your life at that time? What were your relationships like with your family? What were your relationships like with your friends? What was your social like relationship like? You know, how would you rate adventures in your life? How was your love life? What about financials? Like how mm -hmm. tied, like how laser focused and uh, strategized were you with your financials? What about uh, education? Where were you investing in education? Mm -hmm. What were you listening to? What books were you reading? What podcasts were you listening to? Well, what's your nightly routine look like? How much sleep were you getting? Um, so these are all types of questions. As you can tell, I don't need to give the list, right? The idea is if you're able to answer these questions, they'll help you understand the environment that you were in when you felt you're at least your complete best. So yeah, for it's, me, it's, 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 you, had a, you had essentially, you're trying to document the playbook of what success looked like or your successful environment looked like that enabled you to perform well. Yep, exactly. Matter of fact, I think it, I, I just recently on, on one of my interviews, they mentioned uh, for, for the, the SAS Thrive podcast, it was like success does not mean happiness, but happiness almost like does mean success, right? Okay. So like when you, when you want success and, and you can totally challenge this is not for fact, right? But like success many times is a feeling that you get, right? And so like you want to embody that feeling, like what were you going through to feel that way? So for me, it was like, look, I was getting seven to eight hours of sleep nonstop. I was going to church every weekend. I was calling my mom, my dad, and my brothers. I was on a weekly cadence of speaking to them consistently. I was continuing to build one to two meaningful conversations with people on my list of relationships that I wanted to keep um, keep tight. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a podcast episode every single day. I was walking 10,000 plus steps every single day. I was doing my miracle morning every single day, which included reading, my financial planning, setting up my day, reading uh, just like the New York Times news, um, doing my, my prayer and my affirmations yeah, every single day. And so those are just a few of the things that look, I was like, dude, when I do all these things, I feel incredible. Mm. So now every time I was talking with my mentor, this was like six months ago and I was going down a spiral. The past couple of weeks had just been bad. I was losing my habits. I was not performing the way I was. And he was like, all right, look, let's just hold up real quick. Pull up the sheet. I know you have it because I wrote it down. That's what I look at every day, actually, on my affirmations. Look through that entire list, right, of what I was doing then and then evaluate. You know, and I, I realized, okay, one, I was going out too much, you know, having too much fun where I wasn't getting my sleep anymore. I wasn't doing my miracle mornings consistently. Um, my financials weren't really in check. So there was all these small things that were happening. Now, other things I was still exceeding at, right? Like I was still talking to family. I was still doing relationships. My point was, is that it was, it was an easy way to evaluate and be able to course correct quickly and stay on track. Yeah. So it sounds like a couple of things. Number one, what you're, what's the, the overarching like t name of this tip that you're, you're, you're calling it, you're naming it? Weaponized. Weaponized. Okay. So it sounds like to, it's called weaponizing yourself. Yep. Yeah. It's just getting yeah. weaponized. So it sounds like everything you were describing, I just heard system process routine, system process routine, system process mm -hmm. routine. Without it, you're just sort of like floating around and there's no process. That's why if I don't have a set schedule on my calendar, I just end of the day, I'm like sort of depressed. I'm like, what did I just do today? And I'm like, what? so system process routine. Um, there was another thing that I want to ask you. I actually started doing this about a year ago, something similar to what you're doing. As I'm actually going through the motions of like a good day, I'm actually documenting, meaning I'll be worried about something. Let's just say landing another client, whatever it is. 
when I do end up landing a client, I actually document what I was worried about and how it worked out and why it worked out. And then I, I literally have it written down and in fast forward to the future, the future me reads it. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm worried about another client. I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. I used to be in this place. I pull this document and it's sort of like note to self, like a time capsule that I have as a reminder that I reminded the future me um, and it just puts me back yeah. on earth. That's, I really love that. Like even for me, man, you know, starting this new role, I've got a lot going on and, and I've had a bunch of just crap in my personal life where I've been in this really weird space and not performing at my optimal. And because I've been through so many ebbs and flows as every human can, right? You can't be 110% every day. It now to me, because I've been doing this exercise for over probably close to two years now, it's so easy for me to get to know what I need to do to get right back on track. And guys, for everyone listening, by the way, this might not feel tied to imposter syndrome, but it absolutely is. Because like, look, you're showing up, let's say you have a, a meeting with a Fortune 100 or 500 or whatever. Maybe there's an account that you absolutely love. And you're meeting with the C-suite. You're nervous as hell. Maybe your VP is joining and you've got this imposter syndrome. You know, maybe you're new to the role or you haven't done a deal like this. Whatever it is, you need to rise to that occasion, right? You need to show up after you show up and rise to it. And in order to do that, you need to feel like you can. And being weaponized and having that momentum and being in a position where like nothing can stop you no matter what, that helps you lower the voice of like that imposter syndrome internally and being able to rise to the occasion. And so that's kind of why I'm sharing this tip. Yeah. I think it's important for someone because someone could be listening to this like, all right, great. Like I'll just look at my, you know, past successes and my previous roles. And someone could be listening and be like, but I don't really have any, but I would argue that everybody probably has some level of success and just document whatever that was, even if it's the smallest amount. Um, okay. So that's weaponized system process routine, and then look for patterns where you were in the right environment and then reflect back on that and try to replicate that environment. Um, what's another thing? Well, I think the next is a great segue of what you just said. What if you don't have those different successes? Well, no, that's actually a bit different. So what we talked about was the environment to make you feel like, what were you doing? Who were you talking to? How are you spending your time? Like what, what was your life environment at the time you were, you know, ha had this massive momentum and been being weaponized. Now let's talk about looking back at success. So if you're a new SDR or a new AE, or maybe you got a promotion and now managing even bigger accounts, you know, imposter syndrome is absolutely going to show up. Um, it's going to be louder than maybe it was before. And so you can always look back at your past successes. David Goggins calls this a cookie jar, right? So now the thing here is you could say, well, I don't have any. This is my first time as an SDR, or this is my first time as an AE, or I haven't done deals this big. So how do I pull from those successes? But the thing is, is you don't have to limit yourself to something that's relevant. So look, I wrote a the book role was, to the industry to. Yeah. New role to the industry. It could be a new role into the industry. It could be a completely different industry, right? So like before I was selling to enterprise company, I was selling into the venture arms in corporate development of enterprises and to a lot of the venture arms, think like the soft bank and Kleiners and yep. private equity firms. Now I'm selling into more technical data science and engineering. And it's like AI development completely not my space, right? I'm hopping on these calls and I'm like, what the hell to half the stuff these people are talking about? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to address that in a second, but why I love the cookie jar is because coming into this industry. Okay. Yeah. I hadn't sold to a business before I was in B2C. So you could say, well, none of that success relates, but I call BS on that, right? Like I was 19, I sold 17 houses. Yeah. It's pretty damn good. I, you know, wrote a book when I was 19. That's really exciting. Now, look, I get maybe I've had those successes. You could also say, what if I haven't had successes like that? Okay, well, if you're a mom and you had a baby and you've been a stay-at-home mom with two kids or a kid or whatever the situation is, like that's damn hard. That's a full-time job. I mean, that's that's not easy. That is a success. You know, maybe you're in healthcare and you failed your way out of at a nursing school, but you kept to it and then you made it through and became a nurse. Like that right there is lucrative quality. Like, that's success. So you just want to think back to all those different times and write a success book. And then you can yeah. have a notepad. And then after you do, look, it's not going to take that long, maybe 30 minutes, but really think, put time into I it. I mean, I actually think it's a living and breathing document. My little yep. journal that I have, the title, call it the title of the book. The title of the page is called Not to Worry. It's almost like a note to a future self. And I have all these things written down and I always update it. I want to just bring it back for a second because... You, the topic that we're talking about now is like, what if I don't have any successes? What do I look back at? Well, you were 19, never selling houses at 14. So what success when you're getting into real estate did you look back at to say, oh shit, I'm pretty good. 
I'm good to go. Let's get over my imposter syndrome, lower the voices. That's a great question. Um, from there, I looked back at, I sold cars and I was an internet manager at Toyota and was really successful there. Um, before I was an internet manager, I had never sold. Um, I never managed. I had never been an internet manager. I sold right. on the line is one way. So from there, I looked back at, um, I sold cars uh, on the line and I was like, well, I did it there. I can do it here. And then when I sold cars on the line, I'd never sold cars. My first big boy sales job. I looked back though at Journey's shoes and I became a co-manager. Retail, when you're doing like retail? Yeah, on my 18th birthday, they made me a manager. And it was because every month I texted my district manager, my numbers, how I could improve, what could I do different? And I was like, I, if I did that, you know what I mean? Like I'm worthy yeah. of doing well here. And, um, and frankly, even before that, I could, I could keep going back and back. So like, I don't think there's really an excuse for it. It's just, it doesn't have to be success in the way, in the nature that we all talk about it. It doesn't need to be financial or career success. There's a lot of other success it could be. Gotcha. So, I mean, I, I imagine like you, the, the, if, if I were, I mean, I even till today, I, I deal with imposter syndrome, but like, I think the, like the biggest tactical thing here is like literally sp- go lock yourself in a room or go Starbucks or wherever you like to hang out, put some cool jams, whatever, cool jazz, whatever you like, lo-fi beats, whatever it is. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then take a journal, physical journal, forget like Google doc, like a journal so you can carry around. And then start writing, like work backwards and think about all the times when you had a challenge, if you overcame a challenge that you over, overcome and how you overcame it. And then what went into like, what ingredients went into that challenge that you overcame it and then do this. And then the part, of, and then at one point you should have to sort of like blindly trust yourself. I won't say blindly because you have the documentation, but sometimes we, ha- you know, you tell someone to quit smoking because it's bad for you. Like, yeah, I know it's bad for me, but they don't quit smoking. It's kind of like that. Yeah, at one point you just have to like do it. Like yeah. ignore it and, and fake it, so to speak. So yeah. I think at one point you have to just sort of take the leap head first, close your eyes and just trust your instincts or trust the process. You, you do. It, you definitely do. One, yes. Though I, I'd add to that more. You talked about making it a living, breathing document. Yeah. So we just talked about the first part of the exercise. Then you do want to keep updating it. And I learned this also from my speaking coach. I was supposed to go coach people that were in their fifties that were literally paying a 20 year old to coach them to build a real estate business. That's probably when my imposter syndrome was a lot of ever. <laughs> that, sh- that, that was hard. And that was frankly, right. Like I would, never mind. That's a whole nother story. Um, now look, when you're an SDR and you're creating this, what else goes into this book? Well, when you made your first contact in a call and you set your first meeting that goes into your book, when you're an AE mm. and you get your first POC going, whether they buy or not, that goes into your book. When you've had your first negotiation contracts, you know, that goes into your book. When you crush a meeting with a, with the VP for the first time, that goes into your book. Like these wins don't come from winning deals. These wins come from the little wins that you Micro get along wins, yeah. the way, you know what I'm saying? And then that builds that confidence. Yeah. I actually do this. Um, when I launch my business, like I don't have any testimonials. I don't have nothing. I just have my experience and whatever it is. So I started doing free coaching and then I got like testimonials and now, and then like it compounds and you start getting real clients and then paying clients and I have paid clients, et cetera. Every time I get a DM on LinkedIn or text or email saying more, just heard your podcast, love this episode, any sort of compliment test, testimonial, I immediately stop everything and I go in, I take a screenshot of it and I put it into a folder called testimonials. And then I have little subfolders. If it was a testimonial, testimonial about my podcast, I put that testimonial there. If it was something about my course, I put it there and I build up a whole library of more, you're the man, you help me. And then that just builds up my confidence. It's so necessary. You know what I mean? Um, and in times of doubt, you can literally go back and reflect. Oh, so that's good. Yeah. Cool. Well, look, I know we're getting up on time. So look, we've talked about weaponized. We've talked about the cookie jar. I want to talk about three more. I'll make it quick, but I'll make them actionable. Okay. Right. One. So my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> look, massive action. You have imposter syndrome. Great. You don't feel like you're worthy. Great. Do more work harder. Look, I know there's a lot of things going on about anti-hustle culture. Well, the fact of the matter is, I'm not telling you to give your life away. I'm just saying maybe work a little bit harder. Okay. So like when I was in real estate, sounds easy when I tell you 17 folks of selling houses to, but what I didn't say was I was making over 500 cold calls a day through a dialer, Realistic, right? Like yep. it, it, that was realistic. It was obviously robo. It was a dialer, right? So it was helping me get through it, but it's 500, 500, you know, dials a day, you know, or I'm spending more time than more folks, other folks do, you know, when I was new to the industry prospecting. So if you take the massive action, you're going to have more at bats, whether or not they go well, more of those are going to fall through the pipeline, right? So 
Number one, just take more action. Two, over-prepare. So you're feeling that way. Great. Instead of spending 15 minutes before a meeting that you might have with someone important, spend an hour. So I actually do this right now. Again, guys, I'm in this new industry. It's AI, right? I have not ever sold into data science, engineering, like any sort of that kind of part of the organization. These guys have PhDs and all these different things. And I didn't even go to college <laughs> and I'm getting on talking all these technical things. So uh, this is going to be a, a, two, a twofer. One, over-prepare. And two, you don't have to know everything. The way I over-prepare now, if I'm going to a meeting, I'll spend like an hour, maybe 30 minutes. It depends how fast I can find good stuff to use. But maybe I'm finding relevant things the CEO is talking about. I'm finding company initiatives. I'm going through their 10Ks. I'm doing a thorough damn job before these calls so that when I get into the meeting, I don't really have to stress because I have all these different things that mm. I can point to that's going to create this juicy conversation and get them to respect me. Love it. Right, so, I love that over-prepare one. Uh, yeah. So, so the over-prepare and then at the same time, own it. I'm hopping in these calls. Like guys, look, I brought, you know, an SC on the call as well. I joined a few months ago. I'm not going to have all the answers for you. That's why I brought him in and whatever we don't get to today, you know, I absolutely will get over to you. You can leverage the resources around you. You have people at your company, you can leverage. Um, so, so pull, pull the resources around you and leverage them. Um, here's an, an example, uh, back when I was in real estate, this, this gal I was going up against, uh, this guy that had been selling real estate for over 10 years. And I'm like, you're into it. And they're like, look, why should we list with you? This was the biggest listing I ever got, actually. Why should we list with you versus this girl that actually helped us buy this house and has been in the industry for over 10 years? So that's a great question. Why? why? You know, I have a lot less experience in X, Y, and Z. But what I told her is I could promise you this. I have something to prove. Right. And I promise you that no one will work harder for me to get this sold than me. And I don't need to have all the answers, but I will tell you, I invest in coaching and I'm on a team at the time I was for that. And I have all the resources around me. So when I don't have the answers, I have the people that do and collectively have over 50 years of experience. Oof. So I own it, right? Just own it, put it out there, be proud of it. It's okay. And that earned the trust, got the listing, got the household, super exciting. So over-prepare, again, over-prepare for the, my listing appointments, I over-prepare for the deals nowadays, and then own it and leverage the resources. I have a coach, I've got this, I've got my VP, we've got solutions, we've got you know, SEs, yeah. we've got product, bring in your execs, bring in folks, ask for help until you get better and better and better. So to recap, weaponized, the cookie jar, massive action, over-preparing, and then just owning it and being okay with that and using the resources around you are going to be my five ways of overcoming imposter syndrome and, and really being able to, you know, rise to the occasion. Yeah. This was tactical, in my opinion. Um, and I think it is important to understand the backstory. And I think it is even more important to know that, um, in, like an, imp like imposter syndrome or the tactics to get over imposter sy in, 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 uh, syndrome is not, um, bias to like the tech or B2B SaaS sales industry. It's very much like it's a thing that's an emotional thing that applies to any industry. So if you're feeling it in tech, you're going to feel it in an industry that you're not confident in. Um, this is awesome. Where, where can yeah. people find you? Where do you want people to go? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll check me out on LinkedIn, I guess. Um, you can find me at uh, just David W. Durham. Or yeah, and I'll put the, the link, link there. Show, show notes. Yeah. Because on my LinkedIn, right, I'll, I'll be posting a lot of content and then you can yeah. also find the podcast. The SaaS Thrive podcast, selling from SMB to enterprise, which is you know built for a lot of SDRs and AEs that are looking to advance their career um, in the SaaS sales space. Sweet, awesome man. This was great. Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks man.